Friends, something amazing happened. When we finished the draft of this video, we sent it to a couple of people in the Access and Allies community, and they suggested that we actually send it to Larry Harris, the original creator of the game. We sent it, thinking it was a long shot, thinking, eh, maybe, but he replied. Not only did he reply, but he was thrilled about the videos and wanted to do a complete interview. Here's what he had to say about this video. That was, that was refreshing somehow. It was uh, friendly and informative. And, and thank you for um, what you did with 1942.2. Um, that, was, uh, that was great. The, the, the game will do nothing but benefit from it. Thank you. I know, right? That's Larry Harris, legendary game designer and creator of Access and Allies, taking the time to talk with us about our video. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for taking the time, Larry. If you'd like to see the entire interview, make sure you subscribe and keep an eye on this channel. It'll be available soon. All right, back to the video. Are you looking for a world-class strategy game that will allow you to play out the greatest battles of World War II and create new ones? Do you have a need for cardboard warfare? Do you have a weird fixation with little plastic guys? Well, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Board Game Nation. My name is Gary Blevins. Thank you so much for watching. Today we're doing a deep dive into the rules for one of my favorite games, Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition. I'm also excited to welcome a few friends to help us out on this very detailed how to play video. First, the owner of 901 Games, Mr. Shannon Merritt, will be joining us from his shop in Memphis, Tennessee. Shannon's a friend of Board Game Nation and an avid player of all things Axis and Allies. Pones Jones will also be here. He's a lover of board games and runs a great YouTube channel called Total Board Game. He features how-tos and unboxings along with exploring board game concepts and how they stand up to real life. It's, it's a lot of fun. Together, we'll be walking you through how to play and there'll be lots of examples as we go. We'll also be including updates and corrections that have come out since the game's printing back in 2011. We'll talk to Pones and Shannon shortly, but first, some housekeeping. While we'll be focusing on 1942 Second Edition, this video is designed as a primer for anyone looking to play any version of Axis and Allies for the very first time. Now you'll find variations between the different versions, but this will be a gateway to the broader series of games. Also, this version of the game has nearly identical rules to Axis and Allies Online by Beamdog that's available now through Steam. As we go through the video, we'll point out the differences between the tabletop and the online versions. When we're done, you'll be able to jump into the Axis and Allies world with the confidence to begin building strategies of your own that would make MacArthur himself proud. But if this is your first time here, at Board Game Nation we do unboxings, how-tos, and strategy videos for great games like this one, but we also do a travel show that focuses on your favorite board game stores. So, if you like anything having to do with tabletop gaming, this is the place for you. Please take a second and hit that big red subscribe button for us and the like to show us your love. Before we jump into the rules, if you'd like to take a look at what comes inside this game, check out our detailed unboxing linked in the description. It'll help you get a better sense of the game's components and how to tell the difference between the various 410 pieces. As we get to know the rules, we'll not be moving page by page through the rule book. We've worked with a number of educational experts to organize the material to make it the easiest to learn. But we'll do our best to add the relevant page numbers to the bottom right hand corner as we go. You'll also find a link to a searchable PDF in the description below for your reference. Now in this video, we're only going to go over the rules and how to get the most out of your time around the table. We'll not be talking in depth about strategy or tactics. Check out our other videos for those topics. Now, brace yourself. This is a long video, and as we go through, it might seem a bit overwhelming, but don't be afraid. Once we get it set up and into the battle, this game flows really, really nicely. Now finally, if you're here looking for information or examples about specific sections of the rules, jump down to the description for the time codes for each topic. Some of the more complex sections will actually be broken out into separate videos down the road. All right. Let's make it hot. Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition invites two to five players to take on the roles of one or more of the Axis or Allied powers during World War II just after the attack on Pearl Harbor, aka the spring of 1942. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to set up the game and has an average playtime of five to eight hours. So pack a lunch. To get started, let's take a look at the board. The map in Axis and Allies is broken into land territories and sea zones. Each has a name and each has a number. If you look at the setup chart, you'll find the names and numbers of all the territories and how many units start in each. The map is color-coded to show you which countries start with which powers, but for my friends that are red-green colorblind, it's not terribly helpful. You can find the national markers in each of the territories to let you know how it gets started. A couple of quick glossary terms. At the beginning of the game and throughout the game, all land territories will exist in one of three states, friendly, hostile, or neutral. A friendly territory is controlled by you or a friendly power. A hostile territory is controlled by an enemy power. And some land territories have no starting markers and are shaded differently. These are neutral territories. Some are neutral for political reasons like Spain and Turkey, and others for geographical reasons like the Sahara. 
Either way, these territories cannot be entered or flown over by anyone at any time. Sea zones are either hostile or friendly. A friendly sea zone is any zone that doesn't contain enemy surface warships. Any sea zone with enemy surface warships is considered hostile. Some sea zones have land territories in them, aka islands. Each zone will only ever have one island in it, so New Guinea is all one land territory, not separate islands. You can move your guy around on the island if you want to, but it doesn't make any difference to the game. You'll also see that there are some islands that have no names. These are just decorative and have no effect on the game. If it doesn't have a name, ignore it. You can also see that most of the land territories have numbers circled in white ranging from 1 to 12. These numbers represent the amount of IPCs that territory is worth. Wait, what's an IPC? IPC is an abbreviation that stands for Industrial Production Credits. IPCs are the in-game currency that you'll use to purchase units for attack and defense or to repair damage done by your enemies. IPCs are designed as a loose historical representation of the amount of production capability each territory had during the war. If you control that territory at the end of your turn, you'll collect that many IPCs. So, for example, the Baltic States will generate two IPCs for whomever controls it at the end of their turn, while the Caucus will generate four IPCs for its controller. These numbers along the top of the board are called the National Production Chart, and it's used to keep track of the industrial production of each power, aka how much money everybody's making. Pro tip. The control markers on the top of the map have a tendency to accidentally get bumped or moved or whatever, it gets really confusing. So what a lot of people do is they use poker chips or they use an old-fashioned pen and paper. Do whatever it is that you need to do to make it work for you and your friends. Okay, back to the map. You'll notice that a few cities are marked on the map. These are victory cities, and capturing them is the goal of the game. The map features 13 victory cities. For the Allies, London, Calcutta, Moscow, Leningrad, Washington DC, San Francisco, and Honolulu. The Axis starts with Berlin, Paris, Rome, Tokyo, Shanghai, and Manila. While all of these are victory cities, the ones marked with squares are also national capitals and have special rules when they're captured. Before the game starts, you and the other players decide what you want the win conditions to be. Now, this can be whatever you want it to be, but the rules lay out two very popular options. The first, Total victory. This means that one side controls all 13 victory cities at the end of a complete round. They rule the world! Second, and the more popular win condition, is called a standard victory. In this scenario, one side controls three more victory cities than they started with at the end of a complete round of play. So, that's 10 for the Allies and 9 for the Axis. The standard victory is what's used in tournaments and is more popular because it doesn't take quite as long. A big side note here. We've come to our first major error in the rulebook. Shockingly, the printed rulebook says that there are only 12 victory cities. Because it's not like anything important happened in Honolulu in World War II. When in fact, there are 13. Obviously, this error created a lot of confusion, so the makers modified the rules to what we've already talked about. I didn't want you to read the rules and then comment about how I got it all wrong, blah, 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 blah. I didn't write the rules. Call Asbro. Two more quick things about the map. First. This is the mobilization zone, and it'll tell you how much everything costs, how far it moves, its attack and defense capabilities. We'll talk more about this later. Lastly, I don't care what you write on the internet. The world is not flat. If you send a unit off the side of the map, it is not magically swallowed by sea monsters. This is a wraparound map. The left side of the board will line up very nicely with the right side of the board, and units will move back and forth frequently. Whew. Okay, I think we're ready to break out the pieces and actually set up the game. The setup for Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition is a bit tedious and time consuming, but not difficult. The one thing that does give new players some trouble is telling the different pieces apart. Now you can look at pages 4 and 5 of the rulebook for a portrait of each of those pieces, but to be honest, I didn't find it super helpful. In the Board Game Nation unboxing, linked in the description, you can get a detailed look at all of the game pieces. If you head over there, you can jump right to 716 for that section of the video. Once you're comfortable with what all the pieces look like, you can look at any setup chart to get started. On the left, you'll see the name of a land territory or the number of a sea zone. Next to that, you'll see the units that begin the game in that area. For example, you can see from the Japanese setup chart that Japan starts with all of these units and an industrial complex in the territory named Japan. Next to that, you can see that they have three infantry and a fighter starting in Manchuria. You'll quickly notice that the board gets pretty crowded pretty fast. But good news, the makers of the game have given us these handy chips that we can use to represent multiple units of the same type in the same territory. Gray chips represent one unit, green chips are worth three, and red chips are worth five. 
you don't have to use the chips, but they do make the game go so much faster, and if you don't, you're gonna run out of pieces really fast. So you can take two of the infantry units from Manchuria off the board and replace them with two gray chips. In Japan, same thing. You can remove three infantry pieces from the board and replace them with a green or three gray chips. It's important to remember that the unit on top counts as one of the units. So an infantry with two gray chips represents three infantry. A red chip with a tank represents six tanks, etc. Rinse repeat for the rest of the land units. For sea units, it's basically the same process, except in sea zones. Staying with Japan, in sea zone 50, they start with a carrier, a fighter, and a cruiser. Note that sea zone 50 is separate from the Caroline Islands, and the fighter is on the carrier in sea zone 50, not on the land. Conversely, any land units that are in the Caroline Islands are not part of the sea zone. In Sea Zone 60, the game starts with a battleship, a transport, and a destroyer. Again, the Sea Zone is separated from mainland Japan. The transport never starts with any units on it. Again, continue this process until all your sea units are placed. Note that not every territory will start with units in it. The West Indies, Mexico, and other territories have no units at the start of the game. Lastly, we need to talk money. Pass out poker chips, get out a pen and paper, break out an abacus. Whatever it is that you need to do to keep track of the IPC count for each player. Start everyone with IPCs equal to the total IPC value of the territories they control at the beginning of the game, marked at the top right of your setup chart. Heads up! There are two errors in the setup charts. If you add up the IPC value for all the territories that start under the UK's control, it totals 31, not 30, as printed on the UK's card. Place your control marker on 31 and start the game with 31 IPCs. In Germany, their card says 40, when the actual total is 41. So please place your marker on 41 and start the game with 41 IPCs. So I'm gonna take a second and set all this up for you so that you can get a feel for what it looks like. And uh, it's like magic. And just like that, it's set up. Now that took about 30 minutes uh, with one person setting it up and I've done it before. Now it's time for the actual meat and potatoes of the game. I'm going to need some reinforcements for this, so I've called on one of my favorite allies, Mr. Shannon Merritt. He's going to help us introduce the key elements of this game. Shannon's the owner of 901 Games, a fantastic board game store in the Broad Avenue neighborhood of Memphis, Tennessee. Everyone, please welcome Shannon Merritt. Hey Gary, thanks for having me. I am happy to help with anything that will bring more players to this great and my favorite game. Access and Allies 1942 Second Edition has a set order of play. The order of who goes after who. After each power has had a turn, that is called a complete round of play. The order of play is set and does not change from round to round. Every round begins with the USSR, then the Germans, the United Kingdom, followed by the Japanese, and each round ends with the good old US of A. This is especially important because unless someone forfeits, the game will always finish at the end of one of the USA's turns. Each turn is broken into six phases. Purchase units, combat move, conduct combat, my personal favorite, non-combat move, mobilize units, and collect income. In the purchase units phase, you will not surprisingly spend your IPCs to purchase units and then place them in the mobilization zone. Next, in the combat move phase, you will issue all the combat orders to all your units. Here, basically, you are saying which units are attacking which territories or sea zones. Once this phase is over, you can't go back and change this later. Once all your combat moves are announced, it's time to conduct combat. Now you resolve all battles you announced in the combat move phase. You will resolve all the battles for your turn one at a time as part of the game mechanic. But be aware that all combat is happening simultaneously. Once all the combat is resolved, you move to the non-combat move phase. This is where you must land planes into friendly territories or on aircraft carriers. Also in this phase, you are allowed to move land or sea units that were not involved in combat using their available movement. Once you have everything where you like it, you move on to the mobilization of your new units. Take the units you purchased at the beginning of your turn and place them onto territories with industrial complexes that you have controlled since the beginning of your turn. 
Lastly, you collect your income. Count up the IPC values of all the territories you control and collect that money. Gary is going to take you through all the phases in more detail, but that is a solid place to start. Before I send you back to him, I want to share a few tips that should help a few new players keep all this straight. Number one, if you're sitting on the north side of the board, it is hard to see the mobilization zone. Take a picture of the chart with your phone and keep it handy. Or, if you're the host of the game, take time beforehand and make copies of the mobilization chart for each player. Number two, to help keep the turn order straight, take a control marker from each player and set them in turn order somewhere on or near the map so you can see it at a glance. Number three, for the first few games, say the name of the phase you are starting as you go. For example, okay, that is all my combat moves. It's time to conduct combat. Bonus tip, this isn't specific to turn order, but before you start your first round of play, make sure that everyone has agreed on the victory conditions, standard or total victory, any optional rules from the rulebook you want to use, and any house rules you want to add on. This will save you from many messy fights down the road. I hope you come to enjoy this game as much as I do. You can keep up with all the Memphis Axis and Allies action by joining the 901st Squadron on Facebook. Maybe you can drop by for a game with us here at 901 Games. Shannon, that was terrific. Thank you for giving us such a great overview. We'll see you soon. Make sure that you find 901 Games on Facebook and show them your love. Looking at the parts for each power's turn called phases, let's start at the top. The purchase units phase. For the most part, it's pretty self-explanatory. One, order units. Two, pay for those units and repair damage. Three, place those units in the mobilization zone. More on repairing complexes later. A few notes on this phase. First, other versions of this game feature an option that would allow you to spend IPCs to try to develop advanced technologies. That's not part of this game. Second, you can spend or save as many IPCs as you'd like. Third, you can't borrow or lend IPCs to any other members of your team. Last, you need to keep in mind that the number of units that can be built in a territory is limited by the number of IPCs that that territory can produce each turn. Wait, what? I promise it's not as complicated as it sounds. Let's take a look at a couple of examples and sort it out. First, know that an industrial complex is just another way to say factory. And FYI, in case you skip the unboxing, this is the marker for an industrial complex. Let's go to the board. The Japanese setup chart tells us that Japan starts the game with 30 IPCs. Let's take a look at a few ways that they might spend them. For these examples, we're going to ignore any other units that might be on the board. Now, the mobilization chart tells us that the infantry costs 3 IPCs each. So, with their 30 IPCs, Japan should buy 10 infantry, right? Not so fast. Japan starts the game with only one industrial complex, and it's on the main island of Japan. You can also see that the IPC value of that island is only 8. That means that this territory can only produce a maximum of 8 units per round. So, if Japan tries to buy 10 infantry, they'll only be able to place 8 of them. In this scenario, Japan would place 8 units and get a refund of 6 IPCs for the 2 infantry not placed. It's important to note here that over-purchasing and getting a refund is only when this action is accidental. This should not be done intentionally. Let's look at another example. Let's say that Japan has 35 IPCs at the beginning of its turn, and they want to expand their production capabilities. For a cost of 15 IPCs, they can purchase a shiny new industrial complex that they can place in any territory that they controlled at the beginning of their turn during the mobilized units phase. In the same round, they can buy units to place in any existing industrial complexes. So, in this round, Japan chooses to buy an industrial complex, a fighter, and a submarine for a total cost of 31 IPCs. They started with 35, so they'll have 4 IPCs to spend in future rounds. Later, in the mobilized units phase, they'll be able to place the new industrial complex in Kiangsu, but they'll have to place the fighter in Japan and the submarine in a sea zone adjacent to Japan. The point of this example is to show you that you cannot place new units in industrial complexes that were built or captured this turn. However, next turn, Japan will be able to place a total of 10 units, 8 in Japan and 2 in Kiangsu. One thing that confuses people, the number in the circle of each country only represents the number of units that can be built there in a turn, not the number of units that can actually occupy that territory. That number is unlimited and can get crazy. Now there are a few details that we're going to need to cover in other sections like repairing damaged industrial complexes and what happens when an industrial complex gets captured. But that about covers it for the purchase units phase. Now, on to combat.
All right, let's get into it. It's time for combat. Combat in Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition is broken into three parts. Combat move, conduct combat, and non-combat move. In a nutshell, in the combat move phase, you'll issue orders to your land, air, and sea units. You announce how many units are going to attack and where. You can have as many attacks and units involved as you have troops that can pick a fight, or you can give peace a chance and have no battles at all. In the conduct combat phase, you'll resolve all the battles that you announced. While you'll resolve each battle one at a time, all the battles are happening simultaneously. Finally, in non-combat, you'll land planes that survived combat and you'll move units that weren't involved in combat. Now, for teaching purposes, we're going to start just by focusing on land units. We'll double back to air and sea units later. Now, let me introduce you to some of your plastic warriors. Land units include infantry, artillery, tanks, anti-aircraft artillery, shortened to AA guns, and industrial complexes. Each unit has its strengths and its weaknesses. Kicking us off is our trusty infantry. They weigh in at a cost of three IPCs to build and have a movement of one. They have an attack value of one and a defense value of two. That means when this unit attacks, it will score a hit only on the roll of a one on a six-sided die, but on defense, they'll score a hit on a one or a two. Not so great when attacking alone, but solid on the defense for the price. But what is any infantryman worth without a giant gun to bag him up? Artillery have a cost of four IPCs and have one movement per turn. But not only do they attack and defend at two or less, they also give a boost to the attack value of infantry units. So for every artillery in an attack, it will increase the attack value of one infantry to a two. This might not seem like much now, but in big numbers, this can make a huge difference. Tanks are the big boys of the land units. They cost six to build and have a maximum movement of two, which is great but they also score hits during attack and defense on a roll of a three or less. Plus, they have a special ability called a blitz attack. We'll get more into that in a minute. It's really a game changer. The most important thing to remember about all of these units is this. These are the only units that can capture and take control of a territory. So, treat them accordingly. Any aircraft artillery, or AA guns, or AAA, has a cost of five IPCs and has a movement capability of one, but can only move during non-combat. It has an attack value, but it doesn't attack in the same way as anybody else. It's defensive only. They do have a special ability that can really turn the tide of the game. They get a chance to shoot down attacking air units, but we'll talk more about that when we get into air units and air combat. Lastly, industrial complexes. Industrial complexes cost 15 IPCs to build. Of course, they have no movement because they're static buildings, and they don't have a traditional attack or defense value. Industrial complexes are where you produce new units. They can be built in territories that you controlled at the beginning of your turn, and they have a type of built-in air defense against strategic bombing raids. More on that when we talk about air combat. Industrial complexes can never be destroyed, but they can be damaged and they can be captured. Now that you know a bit about your land units, let's jump into an example of land combat. It's time for the combat move of the United States. The Americans are going to announce that they plan to conduct two attacks, one in Kiangsu and one in Kuangtung. Because of the size of the board and the number of pieces, a popular option that's not currently in the rules is to take a control marker for the attacking country and place it upside down in the area that's going to be attacked. This helps everyone see more clearly what's happening. This can get crowded on a busier board. The goal is to be clear about your intention. As long as everyone knows what's going on, do it however you need to. For the first attack, the Americans are going to use one movement from one of the infantry in Anhui and the two movements from the tank in Xinjiang to attack Kuang Su. For the second attack, the Americans are going to use the remaining infantry in Anhui and the artillery and the tank in Yunnan to attack Kuangtong. They indicate this by moving the pieces into or near the territory that they're attacking. Notice that the tank in Sichuan is choosing not to attack and the infantry in Xinkang is too far away to get into the action. This will allow them the option of moving during the non-combat phase. Every combat will end in one of three ways. One, all the defending units are destroyed. Two, all the attacking units are destroyed or three, the attackers retreat. In order to take control of a territory, the attackers must have at least one land unit remaining at the end of combat. They have to have a guy on the ground to raise the flag. It's time to separate the mice from the men and settle these battles. For regular land combat, the attacker chooses the order of which combat to do first. Here, we'll start with the battle in Kuang Su. To make combat easier to track, the makers have given us a battle board slash battle strip. Let's take a look. You can see that it's printed with the attacking units on one side and the defenders on the other. You'll also see the names of all of the pieces. Notice that they're not the same on both sides, so be sure to look carefully. Lastly, you'll see the numbers down the middle. Each of the units in that lane will need that number or less to score a hit. So a tank will need a roll of a 3, 2, or a 1 on a 6-sided die to score a hit, etc. 
Place the battle board in an area clear of any other pieces and place the casualty zone strip a few inches behind the defender's side. As we move the attacking units out of Quang Su and onto the battle board, we'll place the attacking infantry into the lane marked 1 and the tank into the lane marked 3 on the attacker's side. The territory is defended by two infantry, so we'll place both of them in the lane marked 2 on the defender's side. Step 2 only applies to battles with submarines, so we're going to skip this one for now. The attackers roll one die for each attacking unit in each lane, rolling them separately. The infantry needs a 1, a miss, and the tank needs a 3 or less one hit. Now that all of the attacking units have fired, the defenders must select one unit to move into the casualty zone for each hit scored. In this case, the attacker scored one hit. The Japanese will move one infantry into the casualty zone, but all the units will get to shoot back. In the in-game reality, everyone's firing at the same time, but for the sake of the game mechanic, the attacker rolls first. Step 4. Defending units fire. Here the Japanese will get to return fire. The infantry will each need a roll of a two or less to score a hit. The defender will roll both at the same time and score one hit. The attacker selects a unit and removes it from play. Once all the defenders have fired, any units in the casualty zone are removed from play. After all the casualties have been removed, the attackers get a chance to reassess. They can choose to continue the fight and conduct another round of combat, or go back to step three through five, or they can retreat. If they choose to retreat, they must move all of the surviving units to an adjacent territory that at least one of the attacking units came from. For land units, it's all or nothing. They can't retreat separately. For this example, the Americans will press the attack. This takes us back to the battle board for another round starting in step three. Attackers fire, a miss. The tank needed a three or less. The defenders fire, a miss. They needed a two or less. No casualties to remove. The Americans choose to press the attack, and they try again. Back to step three. Attackers fire, the tank fires, and hits. The Japanese select their last remaining unit and move it to the casualty zone. Defender fires back with a miss. Remove the defender casualties, and that concludes combat. They place the victorious units back on the map, place a control marker in the territory, and adjust the national production chart. It's also worth taking note that Kiang Su contains Shanghai, a victory city. What happens when the battle doesn't go so well? Let's take a look at the American second attack. In this attack, we have one infantry coming from Anhui, one artillery and a tank coming from Yunnan, and attacking Quang Tung. This territory is defended by one infantry and one tank. Let's move over to the battle board. As we move our defending units onto the battle board, the infantry defends at a 2 and the tank defends at a 3. When we move the attackers over, we have to make sure that we give our artillery bonus to the infantry. So the infantry will attack at a 2 with the artillery, and the tank will attack at a 3. No subs present, onto the battle. Attackers fire. We start with our twos, both miss. Now a tank at a three, a miss. Defending units fire. First the infantry at a two, one hit, and now the tank at a three, a second hit. The attackers will lose the infantry and the artillery. No casualties for the defense. Well that went badly for the Americans. At least now they get to choose to press the attack or retreat. In this case, retreat is definitely the better option. The surviving tank has to go to an adjacent territory that at least one of the attackers came from. So the tank will retreat to Anhui and that will end the combat. We return the defending units back to the map and Japan retains control of Quang Tung. Finally, we have the non-combat phase. In this phase, you can reposition units that have not been involved in combat based on their available movement. During non-combat, land units may not enter any hostile territory, even if that territory is unoccupied. Let's look at the board for a closer look at how this might work out. You'll remember that the tank in Sichuan and the infantry in Xinkang were not involved in combat. So, the tank in Sichuan will use its two movements to back them up. The Americans can move the infantry to try to hold down the fort. And with that, we've concluded the general combat for the Americans. They've had one successful battle, gaining them a victory city and two IPCs of additional production. They retreated from a battle that went badly, and they've conducted two non-combat moves to reinforce their positions. After that, all that's left is for the Americans to place their incoming units and collect their income. Before we get into those, let's take a look at a few more quick examples of land combat, this time with the Germans and the British in Africa. Tanks have a special ability called blitzing. They can make a combat move through a hostile territory that's unoccupied, gaining control of that territory, and ending its movement in a friendly or hostile territory. 
These moves must be announced during the combat move phase. The player places a control marker on the blitzed territory and adjusts the national production chart accordingly. If the tank's second move is into a hostile territory, it'll still conduct combat there as normal. However, blitzing doesn't work if there are any enemy units in the first territory, including any aircraft artillery and industrial complexes. If that's the case, the tank has to stop there and do combat, and it won't get its second movement. Let's go down to the map and I'll show you how this works. Here we have a German tank in Belgium, Congo, and a British infantry in Rhodesia. During the German combat move phase, they can blitz through South Africa, taking control of the territory, adding two IPCs to their industrial production, and use the second move to attack Rhodesia. If there was no hostile unit in Rhodesia, the tank could blitz through South Africa and still use its second move to attack that territory. And because there are no hostile units, the Germans win. If there was another German unit that wanted to attack Rhodesia, it can be declared as an attacker during the combat move phase and attack with the tank. If there was a hostile unit in South Africa and the tank entered the territory, it would have to stop and do combat there. If the Germans started with a different land unit in Belgium Congo and they wanted to attack South Africa, they can move there and the tank can then carry on to Rhodesia and attack. And in this extreme example, these four tanks were able to take over four different territories with no risk, and by the looks of it, they're going to take a fifth. This move would gain the Germans five more IPCs this turn. And those are the basics of land combat. You now know how to use infantry, artillery, and tanks. You've learned about the bonus that artillery gives to attacking infantry, and the power the blitzing ability of tanks can have over an entire game. But no World War II game would be complete without the constant battle for control of the sky. Next up, air units. The battle for air superiority was a critical part of World War II. Naturally, it also plays a big role here. Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition features two types of air units, the fighter and the bomber. The fighter has a total movement of four, attacks at a three, and defends at a four, with a total cost of 10 IPCs. Their special ability, fighters can land on aircraft carriers. While bombers cost 12 IPCs and have a total movement of six, it scores a hit on any roll of four or less when attacking. But the big downside is that bombers can only defend on the roll of a one. Special ability, bombers have an attack called strategic bombing raids. With this attack, bombers can make bombing raids on industrial complexes while ignoring any other hostile units that might be in that same territory. Obviously, air units are going to have a much greater movement capability than land units, but they can't take control of an enemy territory, and they must land in a territory that was friendly at the start of their turn or on an aircraft carrier. Another way to say this, Air units have to split their movement between combat and non-combat. They have to use movement to get to a fight, and they've got to use movement to find a friendly place to land. But all air units always need to be on the lookout for any aircraft artillery, AA guns. If AA guns are defending a territory and the attacking units include air units, the AA guns will get to fire once at the air units before the attacker fire phase of general combat. The defending player will roll one die per attacking air unit to a maximum of three per AA gun. The AA gun will score a hit for each one that they roll. For each hit, the attacker will immediately remove one air unit from play, and that unit will not get to fire. AA guns will only fire during the first round of general combat, and they don't get to fire again. But they can be selected as a casualty by the defending player in general combat. Clear as mud, right? Let's go back to the map and look at a few examples that include air units and AA guns and see how we might clear this up. When attacking a land territory, it's rare for an air unit to attack alone. Remember, air units can't take control of the territory, meaning that if they're the last unit at the end of the combat, the defender retains control of the territory, so it's good to bring friends. In this example, it's time for Germany's combat move phase. They announce that they will conduct two attacks. The first in the Caucasus, the territory, and the second will be a strategic bombing raid on the industrial complex in Karelia. They place the upside-down control markers at the site of each attack and move units into the battle. You'll notice that I've placed counters for each air unit. This indicates the remaining movement capability of each unit. This is not required, but it's helpful when you have multiple planes coming from different locations. Strategic bombing raids always resolve before other types of battles, so we'll start there. Remember, the bombers are only attacking the industrial complex. They will ignore any other units in the territory, but they don't just get a free shot. All industrial complexes have built-in defenses, a type of any aircraft defense. The defending player rolls one die for each attacking bomber, however many there might be. 
For each one that they roll, a bomber is destroyed and removed from play. Any surviving bombers roll one die, and the total is the amount of damage done to that industrial complex. Place chips under the complex to indicate the amount of damage done. There is a limit to this. The maximum amount of damage that can be done to a complex is twice as much as the IPC value of the territory that that complex is in. Let's get back to our example and I'll show you what I mean. The USSR rolls two dice, one for each attacking bomber. They're looking for a one to shoot down a bomber. One hit. The Germans remove a bomber and roll one die and get a six. Remember, even though the Germans rolled a six, the maximum damage that can be done is twice as much as that territory's production capability. In this case, Karelia can only produce two IPCs per turn, meaning the maximum damage that can be done is four. The other two points are not assigned. Wait, how does damage affect an industrial complex? Damage to an industrial complex limits its production capability. Each point of damage reduces the number of units that can be mobilized there by one. In our example, the complex in Karelia sustained the maximum damage, so the Russians can't produce units there until it's repaired. Players do not have to repair all or any of the damage sustained by an industrial complex, but if they don't, each point of damage reduces the production capability by one, meaning that the Russians will need to spend at least three IPCs during the purchase units phase of their turn to make this industrial complex capable of building one unit per turn, or four IPCs to completely repair it and making it capable of building two units per turn again. Let's clear up something that trips up a lot of folks. Damage to an industrial complex doesn't reduce the amount of IPCs that a territory produces during the collect income phase, just the number of units that can be placed there during the mobilized units phase. On to the next combat, Caucasus. In this example, the Germans are attacking Caucasus with three infantry, two tanks, three fighters, and one bomber. The territory is defended with two infantry, two fighters, and one AA gun. This battle doesn't have any artillery units, so everything goes in the lane marked on the battleboard. The battleboard doesn't have a place marked for AA guns. Place them off to the side of the battleboard. It's important to keep them visible. They will have a role to play in the battle. Step three, attackers fire. Here we go. For each attacking air unit, the defender rolls one die for a maximum of three per AA gun present. In this case, we have four attacking air units and one AA gun defending, one more than the maximum can fire. So the defender rolls three dice and they're looking for a roll of one to score a hit and they scored one hit. The attacker chooses which unit got shot down and immediately removes it from play. The downed plane is destroyed right away and will not get to fire. The infantry needs a one to hit. All misses. The tanks and the fighters all have a value of three, so we can roll them all at the same time. Two hits. Lastly, the bomber attacks at a four. A third hit. The defender chooses to move two infantry units to the casualty zone, but the defenders choose to take the AA gun as a casualty rather than lose a fighter. Step four, defenders fire. The infantry needs a two or less for a hit. They both hit. Now the fighters, defending at a four, one hit and one miss. The attacker needs to assign three hits. The attacker removes all three infantry units. Step five, remove defender casualties. Back to the box they go. Step six, press the attack or retreat. With only two Russian fighters remaining, the Germans will press the attack. Remember, even if the AA gun had survived, it wouldn't get to shoot again. It only fires before the first round of combat. The Germans fire with the two tanks and two fighters all needing a three to hit. Two hits. That's enough to destroy the remaining defending troops. You can roll for the bomber if you want to, but it doesn't really matter. The two fighters return fire needing a four. They both hit. Bad news for the Germans. Now the Germans have a tricky choice. If they select the two tanks to take the hits, they will have no land units left to capture the territory and the industrial complex. Now, this is a strategic choice that will vary depending on the situation, but in this case, the Germans will choose to lose one tank and the more expensive fighter, leaving one tank to take control of the territory. The Germans won the territory, so they turn over their marker and adjust the national production chart. Now, along with any other non-combat moves that Germany might want to make elsewhere, we need to find a place for these air units to land. Remember, even though the Germans took control of Caucasus, they didn't control it at the beginning of their turn, so they can't land units there. The bomber that did the industrial raid in Karelia will head back to Paris. The fighter and the bomber from Caucasus will use their three remaining movements and head back to Germany. Here's the movement count for the bomber that attacked the industrial complex in Karelia. The bomber used the full range of its movements to return all the way to France. This is a friendly territory that was controlled by a friendly power at the beginning of the German turn. So, they're cleared to land. What happens when you have multiple AA guns in a territory that comes under attack? Each AA gun gets to shoot up to three air units. Each air unit can only be fired at once. In the previous example, Caucasus had four air units attacking it and only one AA gun defending. 
So the defender rolled three dice, its maximum. If the Caucasus had been defended by two AA guns, the defender would have rolled four dice. One last thing about AA guns. If air units fly over a territory with AA guns without attacking, the AA guns don't fire. The AA guns only fire if the territory comes under attack by air units. They can still be taken as casualties whether they're fired or not. Two more quick notes about air units. Whenever you make a combat move with an air unit, it must have at least a theoretical place to land safely. There are no kamikazes in this game. Lastly, when an air unit crosses from land onto water or vice versa, that counts as one of its movements. Okay, we've talked about air units and land units. Now it's time to dive into sea units. See what I did there? Sea units, dive in, eh, eh, eh? But I'm gonna need some help for this next part. Let's see if Pones is available. Sea combat is a huge part of Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition. While this version of the game features six different types of naval units, the strategies and tactics built around those battles are often the difference between winning and losing. Now, there's a lot to cover here, so I've asked my friend Pones Jones to come and help us out. Pones has been playing Axis and Allies for decades and has put out a number of very cool videos about this game and lots of others on his channel, Total Board Game. His videos are a lot of fun and have a ton of information. Make sure you check him out and subscribe to his channel. You'll find a link to Total Board Game in the description below. Now, from a studio in Alberta, Canada, please welcome Pons Jones. Thank you, Gary. We have a lot of ocean to cover and apparently no time to shave. So, let the games begin. This version of Axis and Allies has six naval units. Submarines, destroyers, aircraft carriers, transports, cruisers, and battleships. Now, I'm not biased or anything, but my favorite sea unit is the transport because background logistics is the unsung hero of war. <laughs> Who am I kidding? It's the battleship, tossing countless exploding trees at your enemy vessels, all while taking two hits and being able to repair. Woo! Mighty Mo, am I right? All sea units in this version of Axis and Allies can move two sea zones per turn, and they follow basically the same rules as land units for combat and non-combat movement, but each has a different ability and role to play in the game. So let's break them down. Submarines come in at a very affordable six IPCs, and because they attack at two and defend at one, they are primarily used for offense, Plus, they have a few pretty cool special abilities, but also some drawbacks. The most important ability that a submarine has is called the surprise attack. Kind of like what I do when there is only one piece of pizza left in the box. This is basically a first strike ability. That means the submarine will fire in step two of general combat and any sea units it destroys will be sunk immediately. So none of this destroyed units get to return fire business. But more on this when we get to the play examples. For their next trick, a submarine can choose to submerge. This means that before any combat dice are rolled, submarines can choose to withdraw from the battle. They stay in the same sea zone, but refrain from partaking in combat. Kind of like how my wife refrains from eating my ketchup chips in and around my designated Axis and Allies time. Yes, ketchup chips are a real thing. They are ungodly delicious. And as far as I know, you can only get them in Canada. Eh? Because submarines are not surface warships, they can travel underneath unsuspecting enemy units. Subs can treat hostile sea zones as friendly ones. Also, they cannot be hit by air units. So I'm pretty much sold on getting one of these bad boys for the public pool. Go ahead, lifeguard. Tell me to stop splashing in the deep end just one more time. But it's not all vigilante justice for the sneaky submarine. This is the part where we sink a buoy with all of their major drawbacks. They cannot hit air units, cause that would be magical, and they cannot block enemy movement. So they are straight up too sneaky for their own good. Up next is the destroyer. Destroyers are submarine hunting monsters. They cost eight IPCs, attack and defend at two, but more importantly, they cancel most of the submarine's abilities. If an enemy destroyer is present, the submarine doesn't get a surprise attack. They can no longer submerge and run away, and subsequently can be hit 
by planes. And to toss a cherry on this already terrifying seabound subway sandwich murdering frigate, the destroyer blocks the submarine from passing through hostile sea zones undetected. However, the destroyer is rather selfish with its onboard tech as this ability doesn't transfer to your friends. If your destroyer is in the same sea zone as your buddy, and he or she is attacking a submarine, they would have to bring a destroyer of their own to the party to cancel the sub's superpowers. Now, on to the big boys. Aircraft carriers. These puppies took 14 months to build in real life, and coincidentally cost 14 IPCs to purchase in the game. They attack at a 1 and defend at a 2, and can hold up to 2 fighters. No bombers, just fighters. There will be none of this do little raid shenanigans in this house. However, fighters can land on them during the non-combat phase, and thus turns a flat piece of ABS plastic into a floating death island of killing death. Not only does she island on the daily, but if she gets attacked and she has her fighters on the deck, the fighters will join in the festivities and come to the carrier's defense, which does tickle all sorts of my fancy. Now, onto the cruisers. Bra bra. That was for all of my six fans that are actually watching this video. These massive canoes cost 12 IPCs. They attack and defend at a three, they also have a special ability called Offshore Bombardment. You know, like your mom on the deck of the public pool screaming out breathing corrections to your breaststroke during your now excessively awkward swimming lesson. I'm not better. <laughs> I'm not better. Last up for the warships is the end all be all. The evergreen tree slinging, paddle boat tipping, completely out of date before the war ended, Battleship! Battleships are the T-Rexes of the ocean. Large, noisy, and can take lots of hits. They cost 20 IPCs, attack and defend at a four, and also have the ability to perform offshore bombardments. But the one thing that makes battleships worth all those IPCs is this. They take two hits to sink. If a battleship takes a single hit during combat, it heals at the end of the turn like magics. Yes, battleships magically repair themselves at the end of each turn. They don't have to spend months in a dry dock, it doesn't cost any IPCs, and much like my unwavering ability to roll straight sixes, it just magically happens. Physics. We have definitely saved the best for last, as the transport is one of the most important units in the game. A transport costs 7 IPCs, but while they are part of sea battles, they have no attack or defense value. They don't shoot or shoot back. They are much like your grandma's extreme spicy sauce. No wait, that definitely shoots back. Plus, they can only be taken as casualties in a battle after all other units that could take a hit are destroyed. Like the subs, transports don't block enemy movement, so if you have only subs and transports in a sea zone, enemy ships can surf right on by. Okay, so that's all the bad stuff, but here's why they are so important. Transports move land units across sea zones. Each transport can load one infantry unit and any other land unit. For example, two infantry, an infantry and a tank, an infantry and an artillery, or an infantry and one AA gun. Or, alternatively, a transport can carry just one of any type of land unit. When a transport offloads troops to attack a land territory, it is called an amphibious assault. This type of an attack allows you to bring in those mighty cruisers and battleships to use their offshore bombardment abilities. But you will learn all about this when you get into amphibious assaults. For now, you're ready to scuttle your enemy ships and party like it's 1942. I hope I done learned ya some sea combat. Don't forget to drop a subscribe over at my channel, Total Board Game, and I will see you on the next one. Pones out.
Thanks, Pones. Before we jump into the examples that'll help us digest all of that, I want to mention my favorite video from Total Board Game. Pones took the time and did the research to figure out how much each unit in the game would be worth if you converted it from IPCs to US dollars and then back again. So if you want to know how much a fighter would cost in IPCs compared to an infantry or what it should cost, then this video is for you. We'll put a link in the description below. So when you're done here and you've got a good feel for the game, you should really check it out. It's really, it's very, very cool. Now let's get into some examples that'll clear up how your sea units can help you win the war. Let's start with the units that give people the most trouble, the submarine. For our first example, we'll go to the North Atlantic. Here we're going to demonstrate how the effective use of a sub's surprise attack ability can really change the game. Well, it looks like the Americans might be in for a bad day. Let's see how this plays out. The Germans make a combat move with all three subs moving into sea zone 10. Let's assume this is the only battle for Germany and head over to the battle board. Good. Remember, the rules for general combat are basically the same as they are for land combat, with a few changes. Step two. This is where the subs really shine. They get to use their surprise attack. They'll attack at a two, and any ships destroyed will not get to fire back. Okay, let's see what happens. One hit. Not bad. The Americans remove one of the cruisers, so the other cruiser gets to shoot back. Because there are only subs in this attack, we'll skip step three. Cruisers need a three or a less to hit. A hit. The Germans remove a sub. Because the subs sank any hits in step two, we skip step five. Step six, the Germans choose to continue or retreat. They'll continue the fight, which takes us back to step two. The Germans fire with their two subs and score a hit. And that is the end of combat. The cruiser sinks to the bottom of the sea without ever getting to fire back. We jump to step seven and place the subs back on the map. Just a quick note, remember, no one ever controls a sea zone. It's either friendly or hostile. Pretty straightforward, right? Let's look at a few other examples, this time involving destroyers. It's time for the German combat move, and they want to sink the ships in Sea Zone 12. They put a marker down and move the subs. The subs off the coast of DC have no problem, and the subs in Sea Zone 7 and 8 can move under the cruiser in Sea Zone 9 to get to the fight. However, the sub in the med is stuck. It can't get past the destroyer in Sea Zone 13. It could attack the destroyer, but it chooses not to this round. So that gives us four subs versus a destroyer, an aircraft carrier, and one fighter. Let's do some combat. We've got the pieces on the board. Now we have a destroyer present, so no sneak attack. The subs will have to attack in step three. Let's roll. The subs will hit on a two. One hit. Remember, the subs can't hit the fighter, so the Americans have to take the hit on a ship. They choose the destroyer. Because the Americans had a destroyer present at the beginning of the round of combat, the fighter will also get a chance to shoot back at the subs. So we have a destroyer and an aircraft carrier defending at a two one hit, and a fighter at a four, another hit. The Germans lose two subs. The destroyer heads back to the box. Press the attack or retreat. Notice that the destroyer is no longer present. So the subs get their super cool abilities back for this round. The Germans continue the fight. Both subs will get to fire in step two this time and get a hit. The Americans cannot take the hit on the plane, so it sinks the aircraft carrier. And because of the surprise attack, and can't be hit by plane's ability, the subs get to float away in style without worrying about anyone being able to return fire. As an added bonus, if a fighter loses its carrier during combat, it only gets one move to try to find safety. There aren't any friendly carriers or land nearby, so the fighter crashes into the ocean and is destroyed as well. The thing that seems to confuse a lot of people is when a sub attacks another sub. Let's do three battles, and in this example, we'll throw in some transports. Now we're starting to get into examples that look more like the game. Let's see how this goes. The Americans will have three combat moves this turn. The first is the easy one. One sub from 57 will attack the undefended transport in 51. Next, in 52, they will attack with the fighter from Hawaii. They'll bring in the battleship, the two subs, and the destroyer from 57. Finally, the cruiser and the two subs move into 53 from 56. Oh, I almost forgot the bomber in western United States. Can't leave him out. Let's add him to the attack in 52. This is a good reminder that the land units on Hawaii and Wake Island won't be involved in the battle, but that the air units starting on the land can join in for sea attacks. Let's jump into the combat. The first one is the easiest. The transport has no defense value and is immediately destroyed. No need to roll anything. Back to the box. Here's the idea. A transport has no attack or defense value, meaning it never gets to shoot. So if a transport is undefended and attack, I don't care how bad your luck is, eventually you're going to get a hit. So save the time, there's no need to roll, or go to the battle board or anything like that. There's an important concept to know about transports. They can only be taken as hits when they're undefended. 
meaning the attackers couldn't hit anything else. Keep this in mind when you're thinking about subs. They can't hit air units. This can create some interesting situations. Let's check it out. Let's move on to 53. We have a cruiser and two subs attacking a cruiser, one sub, and a transport. Onto the battle board. Here, both sides have the surprise attack and submerge abilities in play. The Americans could change their mind and submerge the subs. The Japanese could submerge their sub and live to fight another day. But the attacker must choose first and before any dice are rolled. For this round, they'll both stay and fight. This creates a, a mini battle before the actual general combat. The attackers roll for their two subs, one hit. The defenders take the hit on the cruiser and remove it from play. The defenders fire back needing a one to hit, and they hit. The attackers remove a sub. They could have taken the hit on the cruiser, but that would have stopped it from firing. Now the American cruiser needs a three or less, a miss. All the defenders that can fire already have. No one to remove. Now the Americans have a choice. They choose to continue. The Americans still have one sub and they plan to attack with it, but the situation for the Japanese has changed. Now they're outnumbered and decide to submerge. Sadly for them, this means that the transport will be undefended and is immediately destroyed. There's no need to roll for this. That's the end of combat. Because there are no destroyers present, it's okay for the Japanese and the Americans to end in the same sea zone. Hey, if you made it this far, you'll probably like what you see. Why don't you take a second, hit that subscribe button for us so that you never miss a thing. Thanks. Now on to the big battle. In this battle, we've got a lot going on. This should be interesting. Both sides have subs, but both sides also have destroyers, so no special abilities. We have two different kinds of units with an attack value of two. Normally, that wouldn't be a big deal. We could roll them together. But the attacker has two subs that can only hit ships. So let's roll for them first. One hit. Now, the destroyer. A miss. Now, the fighter is attacking with a three. One hit. Now, the bomber and the battleship at a four. One more hit. That's a total of three hits, one of which is from a sub. The defenders take one hit on the battleship, one on the sub, and one on the destroyer. You turn the battleship on its side to indicate that it's taken its first of two hits. The subs fire back at a one, a hit. Remember, this hit will have to be taken on a ship. The destroyer and the carrier will need a two, one hit. Now the fighters and the battleship at a four, two hits. For a total of four hits, but the sub hit has to be taken on a ship. The attackers assign the sub hit to the battleship, a hit to the sub, a hit to the destroyer, and one more to the fighter. Casualties back to the box. The Americans like how this is going so far, they press the attack. Next round of combat. This time, we have an attacking sub but no defending destroyer. The American subs get a chance to use that sneak attack. One hit. Ouch. That's going to be costly. The Japanese have to assign that hit to a ship, and the transport has to be chosen last. So, the Japanese choose the carrier and remove it from play. The defending fighters stick around, but the carrier is no more. Now we have the bomber and the battleship at a four. One hit. The defender selects a fighter for the hit. The defenders have the battleship and two fighters looking for a four. But these will need to be rolled separately as well, because the Japanese no longer have a destroyer. The air unit can't hit the subs. They roll for the fighters. One hit. And then the battleship. A second hit. Two hits total, one can't be assigned to a sub. The attackers take a hit from the battleship on the sub and take the fighter hit on the bomber. We clear the battlefield. Seems like the tables have turned. The Japanese have a wounded battleship and a fighter remaining, and the Americans only have a smoking battleship. The Americans decide to retreat. Like land units, all retreating units must go back to the same adjacent land territory, and that territory must be where at least one of those units came from. Air units are excluded from this rule and move during the normal non-combat. This retreat heals the battleship and it moves back to Sea Zone 57. The Japanese fighter lost its carrier, but good news, it can use its one move to land on Wake Island. That just about covers sea combat. We just need to clarify the abilities of aircraft carriers and how fighters interact with them. Now, carriers play a big part in this game, but they can be a little tricky to understand. Let's take a look at an example that'll show you how carriers are part of attack and defense. Plus, another ability that carriers have that I think is huge, but is often overlooked. The first thing we need to do is clear up how carriers and fighters make combat moves. Let's start with something that you're not allowed to do. Each carrier creates a place for up to two fighters to take off and land. The fighters move independent from the carrier, so you're not allowed to do this. You can't move the carrier, then launch the fighters. The fighters take off, from the place that they started the turn, in this case, C-Zone 50. Remember, 
This game has no kamikaze attacks, so every air unit that takes off must have at least a theoretical place to land. However, they don't have to come back to the carrier they started with, or to a carrier at all. The process of setting up the routes the planes are planning to take to get to combat and land safely is called pathing. You aren't bound to that path, but you have to show that there was at least a possibility that your air unit could land safely. Something to notice here. Players can land fighters on friendly carriers, provided that the space is available on the carrier and that other player agrees. If a carrier is hosting a friendly fighter and it comes under attack, the friendly fighter defends with the rest of the units defending the sea zone. But remember, units can only attack on that player's turn. So if the player that owns the carrier moves the carrier into battle, that friendly fighter is just cargo and is not part of the attack. So if the player that owns the carrier moves the carrier into battle, the friendly fighter is just cargo, much like transports, and is not part of the attack. If that carrier is destroyed during the attack, the fighter is also destroyed. Just a heads up, in Axis and Allies Online, you can't land fighters on friendly carriers. I'm not sure why, maybe this will change later, but when we shot this, it wasn't a thing. Unlike moving from a land territory to a sea zone, launching from a carrier doesn't spend one of the fighter's movements. So here you can see that the fighter takes off from the carrier in 60, uses three moves, and plans to do combat in 65. They'll have one move remaining to find a place to land. The Japanese want to attack sea zone 65 and 57 with everything that can reach. Let's see what we can do. One of these fighters will take a shot at the destroyer and transport up here. The fighter may not survive, but it will still need a place to land. The carrier in 60 could move to 64 and provide a landing space for that fighter. It doesn't move now, but everyone can see that there is at least a theoretical place for that fighter to land. Next, Japan wants to attack the American carrier in 57. It has an American and a British fighter on board, and both fighters will defend when it's attacked. What can Japan get to 57? The cruiser from 50, a fighter from 50 can get there with two moves left. The fighter on the carrier in 60 can get there and it'll have two moves left. The fighter from Japan can get there with one move left. Both carriers could enter combat as well, but this is usually not a good idea because they only attack at a one. So if all the air units survived, do we have a place for all fighters entering combat in 57 to land? The fighters with two moves left can land in Iwo Jima or Wake Island, and the fighter with one move left can land on the carrier that was planning to move to 64. Now everyone has at least a theoretical place to land safely. We've covered conduct combat in other sections, so for this example, let's just assume that in 57 the Japanese destroyed the carrier and both fighters and lost all but one fighter. And let's say that the fighter sank the destroyer in 65 and then killed the undefended transport. Now we've got two fighters that need a place to land. A few options. Sea Zone 57 is now friendly, so the carrier in 60 can move out there and have both fighters land on it. That carrier could also move to 64 and grab them. The carrier in 50 could get involved. As you can see, there's a lot of ways to go. I know there's a lot going on in that example, but I hope that it shows you the flexibility that carriers can give you. And all that's cool, but my favorite thing about carriers is how they mobilize. Now land units and bombers, they have to be placed in eligible factories. However, if you purchase a carrier at the beginning of your turn, you can end a fighter's non-combat move where that carrier is going to be built. The result being that at the end of your turn, that sea zone now has a carrier and a fighter in it. Also, the reverse is true. If you're going to end your turn with a carrier in a sea zone adjacent to a territory that you're planning to build a fighter, it can start on the carrier. So let's look at a few quick examples on the east coast of the United States and I'll show you what I'm talking about. The Americans purchased two fighters at the beginning of their turn, which is good news for the lonely carrier in sea zone 13. If that carrier ends its turn in sea zone 11, those shiny new fighters will spawn on the carrier. Now the reverse. The Americans purchased a new carrier at the start of their turn, so if the fighters end the non-combat phase in Season 11, the new carrier can pick them up and have some new friends. Lastly, the Americans can purchase a carrier and one or two fighters. When they're built, they can spawn together in Season 11. The Americans could also mix it up. If they bought a carrier and one fighter, they could be joined by a second fighter that came in from elsewhere. Placing a fighter on an incoming carrier is optional. You can also build fighters on the land if you want to. But this way speeds up the mobilization of fighters in a way they can make a big difference in the game. One last note about carrier and fighter movement. Earlier I said that you weren't bound to the theoretical path that you laid out for your fighters, and that's true. However, no matter what happens in combat, you must make every possible effort to provide a safe place for every fighter that you've launched. Even if that puts you in a bad position at the end of the non-combat phase. You cannot willingly let fighters crash. If you can save them, you must. In the rare instance that you're facing losing more than one fighter because of a failed combat, you, as the attacker, get to choose which fighter to save. One last note about sea movement and combat. On the map, there are two canals marked, the Suez and the Panama Canals. 
These are passable, but they've got special rules. You or a friendly power must control both sides of the Suez Canal at the start of your turn to be able to send sea units through. If either Egypt or Transjordan is controlled by an enemy power, it's closed. Land units can cross with no problem. Egypt and Transjordan are always adjacent. The same with the Panama Canal. While it's all one land territory, your side has to control it at the beginning of your turn before you can pass through. And that's it. You're ready to begin your mission to take over the seas on your way to world domination. Amphibious assaults break into three main steps, sea combat, offshore bombardment, and land combat. Sea combat involves moving attacking sea units into a sea zone that's hostile with the goal of landing troops in an adjacent land territory. Offshore bombardment utilizes the special ability of cruisers and battleships to help soften the ground for the land units. Lastly, the land combat. Land units are offloaded from transports into a hostile territory where they do battle. First, we've got to look at the central piece for all of this madness, the transport. It might not look like much, but it's the most important piece in the game. Let's start with the basic mechanic of how this piece operates. Let's go to the map and see how this works in action. Now it's easiest to demonstrate this during the non-combat phase. The transport can pick up one or two infantry units from southern Europe and offload them in Paris, or the transport can pick up a guy from Libya, a tank from Italy, and move them both to Morocco. Notice that this picked up from two different territories next to the same sea zone, moved one space and offloaded. This ended the transport's movement for this turn. The transport can move to C Zone 16, pick up the artillery in the Ukraine, move back to C Zone 15, pick up the guy in Libya, and drop them both off in Italy. This uses both moves. Or it can also stay put and move units across a C Zone, referred to as bridging, meaning the transport can pick up a tank from Italy and an infantry from southern Europe and offload them in Libya without ever leaving C Zone 15. Remember, this is all non-combat. So, if there was a British cruiser in Sea Zone 14, that makes it a hostile sea zone and your transport wouldn't be able to enter during the non-combat move phase. Make sense? Don't overthink this, okay? A transport can pick up a guy and a thing, make up to two moves, and drop it off or hold on to it. It's really just that simple. If you decide to end your turn with units on a transport, you may be doing so at your own peril. If that transport comes under attack, the land units are just cargo. They don't get to join in the defense of the sea zone. And if that transport is destroyed, the cargo is also destroyed. So it's always best to keep your land units on land whenever possible. So how does all this work in combat? That, my friend, is an amphibious assault. Let's go back to the Germans in the Med. The Germans want to attack Egypt with everything that they can. Without the transport, the best the Germans can do is attack with one infantry and one tank. But with the transport, they can pick up the infantry in Algeria, move into 15, pick up a tank from Italy, and offload them both in Egypt to join the land units that are moving in making this a much more interesting battle. One big note here. The combat will proceed as normal, but you'll need to keep the units attacking from the sea separate. If the battle goes sideways, only the land units can retreat. The offloaded troops can't swim back to the ships, and they can't join the land units on the run. If you commit land units to an amphibious assault from the sea, it's do or die. Let's add some more help for the Germans. Adding a cruiser for the Germans gives them the ability to use the offshore bombardment ability during the attack on Egypt. So, the same move happens. The transport loads the infantry in Algeria, move into 15, loads a tank from Italy, offloads them in Egypt to fight with the other land units. But this time, we add the cruiser. Offshore bombardments are basically a free shot that cruisers and battleships get to take before combat begins. Cruisers will score a hit on a 3 and battleships on a 4 as normal. And any hits that are scored are selected by the defense and moved to the casualty zone. But those units will get to shoot back during the defender's fire phase of combat. If you played earlier versions of this game, that last bit was a change in the rules. Let's see how this combat plays out on a battle board. We've got our units on the battle board. The cruiser hits at a three, so we've placed it in that lane. The cruiser fires first, needing a three, a hit. The defenders move one infantry to the casualty zone. The two infantry units need a one, both miss, and the tanks need a three or less, both hit. The UK moves the second infantry and the fighter to the casualty zone. The cruiser can't be hit during the defender fire phase, so we move it back to the map. Both infantry get to fire back, one hit. The fighter needing four or less, one more hit. The Germans remove two infantry. The British remove their casualties. The Germans take control of the territory and adjust the national production chart. 
A couple of notes. The number of ships that can perform offshore bombardments is limited to the number of land units being offloaded in the same sea zone doing the firing. So you can't just buy 10 cruisers and drop off one guy and fire all the cannons. This also means that ships can't do offshore bombardments when there aren't any troops being dropped off at all. Plus, you can't have the transports dropping troops off in a sea zone and performing an offshore bombardment from a different sea zone. They've got to be moving together. And most importantly, offshore bombardments are impossible if the ship is involved in any sea combat. Let's see what that looks like. In the combat move, the Germans declared a land attack on Egypt with units coming by land and by sea. You can see that Sea Zone 17 has two British destroyers. The Germans will have to clear this sea zone before they can land on the beach. They place markers in both areas. The cruiser moves to Sea Zone 17. The transport picks up an infantry in Algeria and moves to Sea Zone 15, picks up a tank, and then moves into 17. The infantry in Libya walks over and the tank from Algeria moves in. They're hoping to meet up with the tank and the infantry coming in from Sea Zone 17. Now that all the combat orders have been issued, we move into the conduct combat phase. First, we've got to resolve that sea combat. We're going to look at three possible outcomes for that sea battle. The good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll start with the ugly. Back to the battle board. Just the cruiser versus two destroyers. No subs this time. The attackers fire and miss. The defending units fire and get two hits. The Germans must now assign both hits. The first has to go to the cruiser and the second must be assigned to the transport. Both ships and the cargo of the transport go down to the depths. The British destroyers do a little dance. Now that the sea combat is resolved, the land combat would be resolved as normal. But before we do that, let's look at a second way that that battle can end. This time, the bad. Adding a fighter and a bomber to southern Europe should help even the odds. The Germans perform all the same combat moves, but they add the fighter to the sea battle in Sea Zone 17 and the bomber to the land combat in Egypt. Let's go to the battle board and see how this goes. The attackers fire, one hit. The defenders move a destroyer to the casualty zone. Both fire back, two hits. The attackers remove the fire and the cruiser from play. One destroyer down and one remains. The Germans are in a bad spot here. If they press the attack, the transport and the units on it will be destroyed automatically because they have no attack capabilities. So naturally, they choose to retreat. The transport moves back to sea zone 15 and ends its turn there. To make matters worse, the transport cannot unload. It's been in combat, its move is over. Again, all bad for the Germans. It's worth noting here that the land units in the combat have to do at least one round of combat before they can retreat. The loss or retreat from a sea combat doesn't undo the combat moves of the land or the air unit. They must attack and allow the defenders to fire back. Okay, let's reset one more time and look at another way that this can play out. This time we'll use all the same combat moves, but the dice will finally show the Germans some good outcome. Back to the board. The attackers fire, two hits. The defenders move both destroyers to the casualty zone. They fire back, and they get two hits. The attackers remove the fighter and the cruiser from play. The destroyers go back to the box. This time, there's no defending units remaining. The sea zone is clear, and the units move on to the beach. Now, the seaborne German units move into the land combat and resolve the way we've already talked about. Remember, only the units that came from the land can retreat during a battle involving an amphibious assault. The seaborne units are in it to whatever end. What happens if I'm sharing a sea zone or a land territory with a friendly power's units? If you and a friendly power have units in the same sea zone or territory, and that area comes under attack, it's all hands on deck. Everyone defends. Friendly destroyers will cancel attacking sub abilities, fighters will defend from the carriers, all of it. As combat progresses, the defending players will have to agree on the casualties. If they can't, the attacker gets to choose. So work it out. While it's imperative that teammates work together, there's a limit to how far this goes, especially when it comes to attacking. Everyone attacks alone. They can be attacking from the same place, but each power's units only attack on their turn. If they're friendly forces in the same sea zone that you're attacking, all they can do is cheer for you. Otherwise, they don't participate in any way. So sadly, no D-Day style coordinated attacks. In some earlier versions of the game, this was possible, but in the interest of balance, it was taken out. You can move land units on friendly transport, but the rules are a bit unusual. I understand why this is the case for gameplay, but it doesn't match up well with the realities of war. Pones Jones would not approve. Oh, absolutely not. How dare you? And another thing, how dare you? 
It takes a while, but here's how you move your troops on friendly transports. One, load your land units aboard the friendly transport. Two, the transport controller moves it or doesn't on their turn. Three, offload your land troops on your next turn. A common gameplay error is trying to use transports to bridge troops in one turn, meaning attempting to move troops across water on friendly transport in one move. This is not a thing. You move the troops onto the friendly transport on your turn, your buddy has to have a turn, and then you can offload on your next turn. However you do it, it takes at least two turns. Because of this, you rarely see this ability used. Also, in Axis and Allies Online, this feature is not available. You can't move troops on friendly transports. What if my turn starts and there are enemy units in the same sea zone with my units? This happens when an enemy builds units in a sea zone where you already have ships. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. When it does, here's what you do. First, if they're subs or transports, you can ignore them and continue as normal, or you can stay and attack them. Any units that stay in the sea zone and attack have conducted combat and can't move during the non-combat phase. If the enemy has surface warships in the same sea zone as your units, that sea zone is now hostile, and you must do one of these four things. One, stay and do combat with those forces. Two, leave the sea zone, pick up troops on transports if you want to and conduct combat elsewhere. Or three, leave the sea zone, pick up troops on transports and come back and do land combat. Or four, leave the zone and don't do combat at all. You can also do a combination of these. You can have some units stay and fight while others go off and fight elsewhere. Whichever of these you choose, these all happen during the combat move phase. One very important thing to keep in mind here, you cannot load transports in a sea zone that's hostile. If my enemy has a mix of sea units, can I ignore the subs and only attack the surface ships? No. If you attack a sea zone, you're attacking everything that's in it, unless you're attacking with only air units. In that case, the air units can only hit surface warships, so fire away. Also, if you're in sea combat and only subs remain, you can't then choose to ignore them. That move only applies to movement. That rule can't affect a combat that's already in action. What happens when I capture a territory that originally belonged to a friendly power? This is called liberating a territory. When this happens, control of that territory reverts back to the original owner, including any industrial complexes. Remove the enemy marker and adjust the national production chart accordingly. If that territory had an industrial complex, your very grateful buddy will be able to mobilize in that industrial complex on their upcoming turn. They don't have to wait for a full round. Now, all that's true with one exception that we'll cover in just a minute. What happens when I capture a territory that has an enemy industrial complex in it? First, that's awesome. Keep doing that. Mark the territory with your marker and adjust the national production chart accordingly. You can't mobilize units that you bought at the beginning of your turn in this newly held complex. If you hold it until the end of your next turn, you can place units there. Note that any damage that might have been done to the complex from bombing raids is still there and affects production capacity as normal. What happens when I capture a national capital? To recap, the capitals are Moscow, London, Washington DC, Berlin, and Tokyo. And when one of them falls, it's usually a game ender. Here's why. When you take a capital, you place your marker and adjust the national production chart as normal. And then you raid the treasury of that fallen capital, meaning that you take all the IPCs that might be in their possession at the time of capture. But the original controller isn't out of the game entirely, but they can't earn income and they can't build units until their capital is liberated. If a friendly capital has fallen and you liberate a territory that isn't the capital, you get to control that territory. You earn the IPCs, you can build in any complexes there as normal. If you liberate the capital of a fallen friendly power, that territory, the complex, and every other friendly territory that's under the control of a friendly power reverts to their control. Let's look at an example on the board and see if we can clear this up. In scenario one, the Russians control Moscow, but the Germans control Kazakh and Caucasus. The British will move north and liberate both of those two territories. The result being that the USSR goes up by six IPCs per turn and the Germans down by six. Taking a step back, in scenario two, the Germans will take control of Moscow. Germany then takes all the IPCs that were under the USSR's control, and the USSR can't build or collect income until the capital is liberated. The result here is that Germany is up eight IPCs and the USSR is down eight IPCs.
Moving forward into scenario three, the Germans control the capital of Moscow, Kazakh and Caucasus. The British will liberate both Caucasus and Kazakh. But because Germany controls the Russian capital, the UK gets to control both of these territories. The result being that Germany is down six IPCs and the UK is up six IPCs. And the UK can build units in Caucasus on its next turn. Finally, in scenario four, the UK liberates Moscow from Germany and the Allied controlled territories all revert to the USSR. Germany keeps control of any territories that it controlled until those individual territories are liberated. The result here is that Germany is down 14 IPCs, the USSR is up 14 IPCs, but the UK is down 6 IPCs because they no longer control Caucasus and Kazakh. Moving forward, the USSR can now build and collect income on its upcoming turn. It's possible for multiple capitals to fall, but the victory conditions haven't been met. Just keep going. I've seen games where Germany holds Moscow, but then the US holds Tokyo, and Germany holds London, just as Russia takes Berlin. Keep going until someone resigns or the victory conditions are met. Or you've got to go to work the next day, and it's already 3 o'clock in the morning, and someone's screaming at you to go to bed. And that's it. You are ready to play Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition. Congratulations on making it all the way through this video. Thank you so much for watching. Now that you've got an understanding of how the rules work and how all the pieces move, if you really want to challenge yourself, we've got a special video just for you. We created a video that shows an American invasion of Japan and demonstrates all of the rules of the game in one giant example. We'll add a link in the description below. So when you're ready, make sure you check it out. We hope that you'll reach out to your favorite local board game store and connect with the Access and Allies community in your area. Cruise over to our Facebook page and share your thoughts about the game and pictures of the action. Again, a big thank you to Shannon Merritt from 901 Games and Pones Jones over at Total Board Game for helping me out. I'd also like to thank Greg Smorey, Jonathan Bosch, and Jake Smith for their help with the rules and advice about how to put this together. We also had some help with educational design. Thank you to Ms. Meredith Wilson. Keep an eye out for Access and Allies strategy videos coming to this channel. Beginner, intermediate, and advanced strategies for both sides are coming soon. If you found this video helpful, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Share this with your friends. My name is Gary Blevins. This is Board Game Nation. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. In the conduct combat phase. Combat phase. In the conduct combat phase. One take Blevins, that's what they call me. Pipe down, you. In the Canuck. In the Canuck. The Canadians are now part of the battle. Make sure you check out his channel and subscribe. That doesn't even make sense. And that's how it's written. Cut. That was beautiful. Why couldn't I have done that the first time?